All right, good afternoon, everyone. It is a great day here at Nazarene Full Gospel Church. I want to welcome you all uh, to our noonday Bible study. We are in a different location. We're here at our church daycare in our school. So a uh, different venue, but the Word of God is the same uh, no matter where you go. Amen. I learned from my brother, and I always just say this. He taught a lesson when he was about 14 years old. My brother taught this lesson. He always taught that it is not the place that sanctifies the spirit, but it's the spirit that always sanctifies the place. Amen. So, um, and I, I'm just, I'm encouraged that, you know, we're here. We're able to sit and, and gather and, and um, be together once again. Thank you all for praying for me while I was in my absence. Um, and that um, just a minor, you know, trip to the doctor's office, all is well. Amen. So, um, you know, I know where where'd he go? No, oh, I'm I'm still here. It didn't disappear. If we can get those two uh, copies to uh, Miss Bright and Miss Smith, Miss Mary, it's okay. All right. All right. So for those who are uh, joining us at home, um, we're going to be in Exodus chapter four. So give you an opportunity to get your notebooks out, get your Bibles out. We're going to be in Exodus chapter four, and we're going to uh, pass the white. She left off, she, she kind of highlighted, she bridged the gap from Exodus chapter 3 onto Exodus 4. We're going to go through uh, some of the principles of it. And we're going to try to go through 1 through, I believe, it goes to 17 today. And, and then we'll pick up the rest of it on, on next week and finish chapter 4 out. Chapter 4 is, is really interesting um, for those who've ever had a conversation in with God. This is this is where we actually see the dialogue of prayer. Okay? The dialogue of conversation between Moses and God. All right. So the lessons know right off the top, God is not opposed to having conversation with you. All right. Even when he tells you a direction that you may have you you have questions, but you don't question God. Amen. Does that make sense? It's okay for us to have questions, but we don't question God. OK, um, because what he says, that's what we have to do. But it's OK to have questions. A lot of times we're like, oh, I no questions asked. Oh, no. Even Solomon had questions. He said, Lord, how can I lead these people? I'm only a child. If I don't get the wisdom, you're going to have to you have to give it to me. Mary had a question. How can this be? Since I don't know a man. Right. So it's nothing wrong with having questions. We just don't question God. Amen. Before we get started, as always, we're going to ask Deacon Moses to come up, give us a word of prayer um, before we get into our lesson um, so that we just invite the spirit of God into this, uh, our learning and teaching environment. Amen. Come on, Deacon. Let us prepare for prayer. Oh, Heavenly Father, we come thanking you, Father, for your gloving kindness oh heavenly father yes Lord. we come praying this afternoon for those that are home and those that are here oh heavenly father god we thank you for being abiding upon your shadow of the almighty yes Lord. father we thank you right now for everything that you do for us father we pr we ask you right now to prepare our hearts and our mind and our ears for your word oh heavenly father god bless the man that's going to bring the word yes, in jesus name amen 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 so Exodus chapter 4, we know that we've already seen our burning bush experience. God has spoken to, or he is still speaking um, at the burning bush. So the bush still on fire, <laughs> okay? While we're still having this dialogue of God speaking to Moses, it is still, we are still at the burning bush, okay? Um, so it's been burning since chapter 3, it's still on fire right now. Please understand, when the Bible was written, it was not a break, it was a continuation of action. All right, so that's why we're still here. Now we're getting ready to get privy. We're getting to see the insight of the conversation that God has with Moses. And we also get to see God's patience with us. Amen. God's patience with us. And we get to see a characteristic of God that he is he is he is uh, what they call the forbearance and the patience. And he's kind and he, he he's like a loving father. He is not. Uh, too big that he's not willing to explain. Amen. I think we've we've some of us who kind of not say raised wrong, but our discipline toward our kids, we got frustrated with our kids because our kids had questions. 
right? And so, you know, don't you ask no questions. Well, I don't know what to do, <laughs> you know? And, and, then, and then the unfair thing was of parents is that we expect our children to know or we set these lofty expectations without any explanation, okay? So even though our loving Father, Heavenly Father God in this text, he says, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll dialogue with you. I think if we just realize and learn how to have dialogue with our children, or with each other, a lot of times, you know, people get mad in the church. Well, well, I need you to do this. Why do that? Don't be asking me no questions. Just do it. Wait, 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 wait. Why am I doing this? I need to know why I'm doing it. You know how you know how it gets. Now you get, you know, the deaconess been doing, you know, baptism for so long. You get a new deaconess. Well, how come we do this? Just do what I'm telling you to do. Why, why am I doing this? Why, why am I wrapping this person up in 50 sheets before I put them in the water? I don't, I don't get it. You know, I mean, so it's okay to have questions, all right? So put in your notes, it's okay to have questions. We just don't question God, amen? All right, so get to verse 1, verse 2, verse 3. Um, then we get, <laughs> verse 3 is really funny. Um, but so we start to look at when God is, Moses is saying, well, God... What if the people don't believe me? And then the Lord said, you tell them that I am sent you. I am that I am. And, you know, we almost took off running across the church when we got to that point. And then we talked about the fact that everybody's going to have something in their hands when they leave. Right. So Moses has some more questions. So verse one starts off with a question. Moses answered, what if they do not believe or listen to me and say that the Lord did not appear to you? And the Lord says to Moses, what is that in your hand? All right. One thing about God, God never when he wants to speak to you, he will use the very ordinary things that you use every day and do something supernatural in them. Amen. So God takes our ordinary things. And he said, I can even use that for the supernatural. Moses, what's in your hand? It's a staff. She said, throw it on the ground. And the Bible says it became a what? A snake. Right. So once again, ordinary. OK. God says, if, I, if you have questions, I'm going to answer them in the way that you can understand. I'm just going to use something ordinary. And that's how Jesus taught parables. For the kingdom of heaven is like a, what, a vineyard or a man who hires out a field. It's something that you have that's ordinary, but I'm going to put a kingdom application to it. All right. So the kingdom application here is that, of course, we know that a stick or a staff is what we call an inanimate object. OK, it's 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 just there. OK, it's a it's not alive. This podium is not alive. So if this podium right now morphed into an alligator or a raccoon, y'all would take up up out of here. All right. Because in the next part of that verse three, it says, and when the stick turned into a snake, what did Moses do? Moses ran. That's how I know that these black people in the Bible. <laughs> I'm telling you. I'm telling you. They got some kind of color to them because I'm telling you. You don't see Moses saying, Crikey, look at this snake. It's so lovely. It's so delightful. No. Moses ain't pick that thing up. <laughs> what did Moses do? <laughs> ain't no crocodile dundee up in here, bro. God rest his soul, soul, Steve Irwin. Oh, crikey, look at this snake. It's so beautiful. Look at the texture. Nah, bro. You know how they have those, uh, you ever see the show now that got called Snake Hunters? Oh, no, they do. They got snake hunters, and, they, and, and it's interesting because they use a concept right here in the text, how to catch them. The Bible says, and the next thing Moses did, he picked them up by his tail and he became a, a, stick, a stick again, a staff. That's how these snake hunters do now. They pick, they know how to pick the snake up by the tail, so they won't be injured. Yeah, so you, I'm telling you, they got it right out the Bible. And they, now that's a crazy way to make your living, but they have them. We don't, we we just talking about it and be about to run out of here. I mean, she climbing up the wall. But but here's here's a biblical principle, right? The Lord says, I'm going to take the ordinary. And do the supernatural right in front of your eyes. Every sign and wonder that he performed in Egypt was just ordinary things, ordinary days. But he did it right before your eyes. 
It was a precursor of the things to come. God is saying, look here, Moses, what I'm getting ready to do in your life, it ain't something that somebody going to have to come and tell you about. The miracle that you're getting ready to receive is not something going to be some hearsay or by some third party. God is saying the miracle I'm going to perform in your life is, matter of fact, is something that's already something that you could probably put your hands on. And I'm going to do it right in front of your face. Right before your eyes. If you're taking notes, you write down in that whole section, God's going to perform a miracle right before my eyes. God's going to perform a miracle right before your eyes. Now, there's another biblical principle we have. The staff. Okay? The staff. It turned into a snake. He picked it up by the tail again. It turned back into a staff. The staff went through three phases of transformation. Stick. Snake, back to stick again. Okay? That's, that's a symbol, a pre, that's what you call, that's a foreshadowing of restoration. Okay? It's a foreshadowing of restoration. Which means I understand the, the evil or the circumstance that you're in. But I want you to understand, I'm going to restore you back to what you're supposed to be. And the stick, snake, stick again. Rest, that's, that's, how, that's restoration. Okay? Now, snake represents what? What does what is, what is snake represent? All in the Bible, it's, it represents what? Evil. All right? Something sinister. Something, you know, and it, and, it, and it represents, even we're told in Genesis chapter 3, and the serpent who was more cunning than any beast of the field. Okay? So we, we see the conniving. That, that's what the snake represents, right? Now, the rod, it represents the tool of the what? Of the shepherd. Okay? Who guides what? Sheep. Okay? So we're always looking at those objects in the Bible. Just don't look over them. But here it is. The original, the original, the original plan. God to guide his what? His sheep, his flock, his people enters evil. Then, no, eventually you're going to come back and be my people again. Okay? It is, it is the theory of restoration. So when you see that scene play out in the Bible, stick, snake, stick, that's God saying, I am still getting ready to restore you back to what you're supposed to be. Amen. All right. So Moses ran. Then the Lord said, reach out, take your hand, take it by the tail. So he reached out, took hold, turned back to his staff in his hand again. This, saith the Lord, is so that they may believe the Lord, the God of their fathers of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. All right. So it's validation. OK, validation that I have come to you when God restores you and I back to what we're supposed to be. We don't have to go telling anybody about it. It validates who God is in our lives. Amen. When God restores you back and brings you back and sets you back up that no one even know that you've been through something that validates who God is in your life. Amen. When 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 you find yourself having fallen. Nobody's seen you fall. You get back up and you get back to where you are. That's God showing you, hey, look, I'm still showing up in your life. Amen. That's the validation. So if we need validation from anybody. You don't need it from the pastor telling you. You don't need it from the deacon telling you, the preacher. You know and I know in my life things that I have gone through, what I've, what I've, what I've fallen the sin I've fallen into, the shortcoming I've fallen into, God's mercy, his grace. And now that I'm back to where I need to be, that's God saying that's with me the whole time. Amen. That's so you will know that the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob is still watching over you. Amen. So we get now now to verse six. God is taking Moses to a more series of of affirmations, right? Then the Lord said, put your hand inside your cloak. So Moses put his hand into his cloak and we took it out. The skin was leprous. Okay. Leprous, 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 
First time we see that in the text. Okay? First time we see of a skin condition of leprosy in the text. All right? It became leprous. And it had become what? White as snow. So if his hand turned white, okay. So now he said, put it back into your cloak. And Moses did. It is again, took it back out. When he took it out, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. All right. Once again, restore that theory of restoration. Healthy hand, leprous hand. Back to a healthy hand. So what God is saying, what God is saying here is that this deliverance is not necessarily about getting you out of bondage. Okay? Most times people just want to get out of trouble. God, get me out of trouble. Get me out of this bondage. I'm in this, I'm in a, uh, I feel like I'm shackled. I think the God is saying, I don't want you to necessarily pray to be released from bondage. Pray for restoration. Seek me for restoration. Amen? And if we would seek the Lord for restoration. Along with restoration comes deliverance. Be everything. Okay? This is, remember, this is everything. The now, the now takes care of all the needs in Egypt. It's called the Great River. Right? Everything that moved along, the, the barges, that's how the goods came in and out of Egypt through the Nile River. Right? Economy was driven through the Nile River. Everything was in the Nile River. Egypt was probably one of the first civilizations to have actual, you know, a, a system of, you know, sewage and how to move it out. And they use it all through the channels of the Nile River. Right. That was everything. The Nile covered what? Everything. He says, take water from that. And I want you to pour it on the ground. From the river. And it will become what? Blood on the ground. If they don't believe that one, then they will believe in the blood. There was always the concept of the Lord trying to make us believe in the power of the blood. Okay? And the blood would do what? Cover the what? the ground so the very same place that you stood where you were once in bondage the blood covers the blood covers so I no longer see the ground I see the blood now watch this go a little deeper he says and because you did this Satan in Genesis chapter 3 on your belly shall you crawl, and you shall eat the what? Dust of the ground. All right? Dust of the ground represents man. Because out of the dust of the ground did the Lord form the man. So Satan's job is just to eat man, the creation of God, to devour. The thief coming what? To steal, kill, and destroy. He is a royal lion seeking whom may he who may what? Devour. So the ground... The dust, that represents man. You pour the blood on the ground, I no longer see the dust, the man, I see the blood. Amen? Foreshadowings, different imagery, okay? The foreshadowing, okay, of things to come. All right? So what Moses was getting was this precursor of Calvary. The restoration of man. The blood covering of man. All that in that exchange at the burning bush. Amen. And then Moses said to the Lord. Now. Moses' first question was suppose they don't believe me. Right. And then the Lord goes. Takes him through this whole series of examples. Right. Then the more Moses said to the Lord. Parting your servant Lord. I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your service. 
I am of slow speech and tongue. Now, the Lord is going to get frustrated. He's going to get downright upset. <clears throat> when the Lord asks you and I to do anything, amen, Moses now starts giving God excuses of why I can't be what you call me to be. Ain't that something? God calls us and then we tell God, hey, wrong number. Right? The Lord has called us to do a great work and we, and we give God that tone. Do, do, do. If you have reached this recording in the error, please hang up and try your call again. Because we cannot fathom in our minds with all of my imperfections. Lord, you will still call me? With everything that I go, like all of my imperfections. And we ain't just talking about my slow speech and I, I can't speak and I can't do all this here. No, we ain't talking about your fugitive past. You done killed people, Moses. Buried them in the sand. Been out here with these sheep hiding out. Now, when it's time for me to tell you to do something, oh, 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 oh. I can't talk. I'm not, I'm, I'm not, I'm slow of speech and tongue. He gave him all those excuses. Isn't that something? We give God a whole bunch of excuses, but he's been so good to us. The Lord kept you, Moses, from really being chased and pursued by Egyptian law, which means you were found guilty of murder. They could have came and killed you. But the Lord kept you. Allowed you to be blessed with a wife, a, 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 a son. You done learned the business, the trade. You done made money being a shepherd with selling your wool. And all that God has done for you, we're going to tell God, oh, I can't do that. Let's, let's put a check in our spirit real quick. If God has done anything for you, whatever he asks of you, you ought to say, here I am, Lord. Here I am, Lord, send me. You know the prophet Isaiah? was prophesying and he didn't even know the Lord at first. By the sixth chapter, he saw the Lord high and lifted up and then he realized then, I'm a prophet, but you know what? I'm a man of unclean lips. Lord, I thought I had it together. And I thought I was prophesying and doing all this stuff in your name. Thought I had it together. And then when my family member died, King Isaiah died, when I stopped prophesying for what my, my, my cousin wanted to hear and start saying what thus said the Lord, then I saw the Lord. And the whole time I was doing it wrong, and now you're going to give me an opportunity to do it the right way? Here I am, Lord. God, all the times I did it my way, in your name now, I did it in your name. <laughs> and I was still wrong, and you still kept me, and you didn't strike me down, Lord, now you want me to do something? Here I am. Amen. Moses said, I can't speak. I'm slow of speech. Then the Lord said to him, who gave human beings their mouth? Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now, you need to push pause right here. He says, who gave human beings their mouth? Who makes them what? Deaf or mute? <clears throat> Who gives them sight or makes them blind? That's when Jesus had to correct his disciples. John's gospel, the disciples, and Jesus walked by this blind man who was blind from birth, and his disciples said, Lord, who sinned that this man should be born blind? His mama or him? And Jesus said, nobody. I did. Go back to Exodus chapter 3 4. Who made man's mouth? I can do, says the Lord, whatever I want to do. And the reason I give you limitations, the reason why I give you the limitations that you have is so that when I move through you, no flesh will be able to glory in my presence. Because you know, and I know, out of all the limitations that I have, ain't no way this could have happened unless by God. The Lord will, you do you realize that the Lord designs 
ailments. Okay? And, and, and challenges, physical challenges that we have. So that when we continue to do, somebody say, I didn't even know you were sick. Of course you didn't. Right? Because why? I never stopped doing God's bidding. I've never stopped. He used me even in. He uses you. He will use me. He will use whomever he will. Physical handicaps and limitations don't stop God. So why stop yourself? Physical limitations, they don't bother God. Well, Lord, I, I, I stutter. I know you stutter. I made you that way. Ain't it funny? We tell God about us. By the way, you know I got this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I made you. <laughs> and it's so that we will not use that as a crutch or a handicap. But we go on anyway. Who made man's mouth? Moses? The deaf. The mute. Who gives them sight or makes them blind? Is it not I? Don't take your eyesight for granted. The Lord gave that to you. Well, I need to wear glasses now. Yeah, the Lord gave that to you too. The Lord says, at any given moment, do you realize any given moment, everybody is one breath away from God taking you or leaving you here. He just told you right there, hey, I can design what I want, who I want. He says, is it not I, the Lord? Now go. Now go. Here we go. And I will help you. And let's go down God's resume. Genesis chapter one. In the beginning, this same God now made the heavens and the earth and the earth was without form and darkness covered the face of the deep then God said let there be light and there was what light and then God said let the greater light rule by day and the lesser by night and then God said let there be waters and let a firmament be between the waters and the earth. Created the heaven, right? A firmament. He did all of those things. He said, let there be and let there be and let there be. Keep that in mind. That's the same God that turns around and says, and I will help you. You missed your shot right there. The same God that made heaven and earth. The same God that caused worlds to come into existence. The same God that spread out the seven seas. The same God. The same God that caused the stars and the sun. He says, I am going to be with you. So he's so powerful and mighty that he can make the heavens. But yet he's so close and near. I would say the but he said, and let the land animals appear. They let the beasts of the uh, 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 of the, the cattle of the ground let them come up, and they just sprouted up out the ground. And that same God is saying, "I will be with you." And so the God that's the creative God is walking next, doing what God called you to do, and He sees what you need on your journey. If He is with you, He's he gonna be like, "Let there be." Let there be the right people for her to meet. Let there be the finances in place. Let there be. If I gave you this vision, I need you to get to Tuesday because when you get to, when you get to Thursday, rather, you get to Thursday, then there's going to be the banker that you need to see. And I already created a scene and said, let there be approval. He said now, and I will be with what? You. Right? I will help you. The same God that said, let there be, he's walking right alongside you on your mission on a tough assignment. Preach, Wesley Davis, I'm trying. (laughs) 
So God said, I've called you this. You just go. Tell him what I said. But Lord, I need, hey, 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 I ain't asked you all that. <laughs> you just keep walking. And you keep doing. You stay to the course. And as I see it come up, just like I saw the world being nothing, and, and the earth was without form. And, and darkness hovered the face of the deep. And then God said, let there be light. So when I see you walking in my will, according to my plan, according to my word, and you get ready to go to a dark place. Oh, 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 wait, hold on. Before you get there, uh, let there be light. And what was once hidden from you now shall be revealed unto you. Amen. And I will help you speak and I will teach you what to say wait a minute so you're going to help me you're going to walk with me and then you're going to teach me so you're going to do it the first time but then you love me so much that okay now just like I said let that be I'm going to teach you how to say let that be because because if you are made in my image and in my likeness and you are like me, you can now speak those things that are not as though they be and they shall come to pass. Because if you like me and I said I'm going to teach you, then you can walk up to the mountain and say, uh, be thou removed and cast into the sea. Then you can step out on faith and say, uh, let there be. <laughs> let, me, let, let me, let me, let me, let me, let me try this. And the Lord, like a loving father, go ahead. Let me see you, son. Let me see you, daughter. Go ahead. Let, let, let me see you. You look back at him. Hmm. And by his stripes. I'm healed. He walk in there. The doctor say, you know what? Really couldn't find nothing. And you look back at that, you're like, what I told you, boy. What I told you, boy. Next thing you know, man, I'm, I'm, I'm like, my, if we, it, it'll be a poor thing. There ought to be an expectation. This is an expectation of God. If you are my son, my daughter, Think about your kids. If I raise you in this house, first of all, if you're my kid, you don't look like me. Huh? My son, Wesley III, he got the same DNA that I have. Believe like me. Oh, you so arrogant. No, my daddy taught me some things. Where she get it from? She get it from her daddy. <laughs> Let there be. Amen. The authority from one Genesis one twenty six and let them have dominion. That means I don't lose at anything. Moses, I will help you speak and teach you what to say. And when you stand up and you tell Pharaoh, let my people go. Pharaoh, I don't sound like Moses. I used to know. No, because I stand in the authority of my dominance of my father and he said, let there be. Turn them loose. Do you realize that Moses was supposed to be shot on sight as soon as he said that to Pharaoh? You don't just get to talk to the king any kind of way. You kidding me? Hey, let my people go. And Pharaoh said, well, who is God that I should let your people go. The fact that Pharaoh had further dialogue with Moses, it let Pharaoh know that he was contending with another power. Because the rule said, let my people go. Man, go on somewhere. Pow. You know what I'm saying? Man, take this joke out, hang him right now. Are you kidding me? But because why? Power talk to power. And at one point, when you're having a power struggle, you're going to see who's the greater. 
who's the lesser? Yes, Moses, if you would just talk, they will hear the authority that I sent you in. But then Moses, again, in his carnality, remember, he cannot. And what happens to you and I, we cannot accept. We cannot bring our minds to conceive the number one, the mercy of God, the kindness of God, the awesome, forgiving power of God, the overshadowing of God. We can't we can't conceptualize it. What if Mary had a Hey, I don't know, man. And the Holy Spirit will do what? Mary overshadow you. So Moses still can't understand his concept. So he still continues to lean on his own understanding. The Bible teaches us, Proverbs 3, 5 through 7, that to trust in the Lord with all of thine heart, right? And lean not. So Moses is saying, Lord, I can't speak. Let me lean on my own understanding, even though you told me all of that. Pardon your servant, but please send someone else. Because he cannot conceptualize here, fathom, can't fathom that God has sent me. I can't do this. I can't. Lord, and he's leaning on his own understanding. And then the Bible says, then the Lord's anger. Here we go. Mm -hmm. All right, it's a fine line. Mm -hmm. You can go from grace, mercy to be downright. Uh, the Lord's anger burned against Moses. Son, a lot of things you can do in life. <laughs> Who want to make God angry? There's a sermon that was written. I think my C.H. Spurgeon long, many years ago, sinners in the hands of an angry God. It might have been Spurgeon, might have been another theologian from, I'm going to look it up. I think I'm wrong, but one of those theologians, sinners in the hands of an angry God. And the Lord will get angry at us. The Bible teaches us that he will not always strive with you. You know what I'm saying? His anger lasts for what? A moment, but his favor for life. So he will get angry. The question is, well, his anger won't last forever. Yeah, but you don't want to experience God's anger in that moment. You don't know what that is going to look like. God can get angry for you for one minute, but the after effect of that could be a lifetime. I don't want to find out. And the Lord's anger burned hard against Moses, and he said, what about your brother Aaron, the Levite? I know he can speak well, and he's already on his way to meet you. And he'll be glad to see you. You shall speak to him and put words in his mouth, and I will help both of you speak. Here you go. I will help both of you speak and will teach you what to do. That's a repeat of what we just saw in the text earlier. So the people that you think is so much better and qualified, the Lord said he need help too. I need, they need to be taught some things too. You thinking that you, well, I'm going to get him. He don't know just as much as you do. Matter of fact, you might know more than him. See, Moses, you thinking Aaron is, is the one need to go. It's you, my brother. You want to know why? Because Aaron is on your way. To, he's on his way to meet you. You, however, was on your way to meet me. So you saw me and your brother is just seeing you, but your brother don't have the same experience that you have, which means your brother is not qualified because you're the only one that talked to me face to face. But you thinking about, oh, my brother. He said, okay, fine. Talk to him. Speak through him, but I still going to have to teach him and you. Because he's just as dumb as you are. He's just, as, he's just as unqualified as you are. And what make us think that we got to put all this qualification in people? Oh, oh well, well, well. You know what? That's, you know how we go? Well, we're not going to do nothing until this particular sister come to town because she got the most education. Or he got the most education. And we put people in these great big lights and the Lord be like, they don't know me no more than you. Matter of fact, you know me even more. Because while they depend on their degrees, 
You depend on your prayers. And for all that they have, you got it because of your faith. Your faith wasn't in the Greeks. I ain't saying nothing wrong with the Greeks. But your faith was first in me. And with that faith pleased me that I elevated you without all the qualifications you thought you had to have. Let me speak to somebody that's thinking that you got to have all these qualifications. Let me tell you something. We talked about it Sunday. If God be for you, who can be against you? Amen? Whatever your qualifications are, that don't mean that's not, that's not your success. Your success is if God be for you. Moses, God is for you. Moses, I am for you. So therefore, Pharaoh can't be against you. Amen? This is what happens to, to, to the relationships we think we have to have. We'll learn as we go through the Exodus. As so much as Moses depended on, you know, or thought he had to depend on Aaron because he did not believe that he was as qualified to do this mission. Unfortunately, it would be Aaron who would lead the people in idol worship. It would be Aaron who would help the people erect the golden calf. It would be Aaron and Miriam, his brother and his sister, who would murmur and complain against him. Okay? And Aaron repented. Miriam kept on with her little flip mouth. And the Lord cast her with a spell of leprosy. Okay? And the people that you think you have to depend on is Aaron's brother and his sister. And that's why when Jesus was teaching, and they said, hey, Jesus, man, your, your brother and your sister and your mama out here. He's like, hey, hey, who is my mother, my brother or my sister? And he turned his hand towards the multitude and he said, these who do the will of my father shall be my mother, my brother, my sister. Because he understood that familiar relationships only take you so far when you have been called to do the supernatural. Okay. And if your dependence on that if you have soul dependence on that, then you're going to miss me every time. Amen. And the Lord is saying, no, fine, you won't take Aaron. But long down, ways down the line, after we get through the Red Sea and after you become, after, you know, everybody sees that my hand is on you. Okay. After a while, Moses, they can't go with you. The flesh will, flesh will fail you. That's what Aaron represents. The failure of the flesh. Aaron had a weak moment. His weak moment by that time, though, look, check this out. The children of Israel were so vast and big. They were, on a, they were out of Egypt. They were in the wilderness. I can't afford you to have that moment. Now, nah, it's too much at stake. But if he had just gone anyway, Aaron would have never had that much pull in his life. Let the Lord lead you. If those decide to come along, come with you, great. But remember, you don't need them. You are more than qualified to do the job that God has called you to do by yourself. Because he called you to do it. Now he will show you who to bring with you. But please, don't ever equate they help you as you need them. You understand? I appreciate you helping me, but I don't need you. I really do. I appreciate the help. I appreciate the ministers. I appreciate the deacons, the trustees. I appreciate the staff. That, that, that helps me a tremendous. But I will still lift my eyes to the hills. Marquis Thomas, rest her soul, her favorite verse. I will lift my eyes to the hills from whence come my, my help come from the Lord. I appreciate your help. I don't need you. Amen. 
And we've got to put people in their proper places in our lives. I appreciate your help, Peter. Far be it from you, Lord, that you must suffer that. I appreciate your help, Peter. I don't need you, though, because you're in my way. Get thee behind me. Lord, I got these two swords. We can do something with them. Put them away, Peter. Permit even this so that the will of God may be fulfilled. Oh, thug Peter, that's my dude. <laughs> Kept him a blade. And a cuss word. That's right, Miss Dottie. <laughs> Peter cut you twice with his tongue and with that sword. And I appreciate your help, but I don't need you. Now, let me tell you who I do need. I need the Lord. And I need him every hour. Oh, bless me now, my Savior, for I come to thee. Amen. Amen. God bless you, Nazarene. We always end our broadcast with this. If you don't know who the Lord is, please understand you need him. Okay. It's great to have parents. It's great to have a husband and wife. Uh, it's great to have friends. It's great to have sisters, brothers. But can't nobody do you like Jesus. You need the Lord. You need him so bad that you got to confess that you, you, all, you have to confess with your mouth. And believe with your heart that God is raising from the dead and thou shalt be saved. That's how bad you need them. That's how bad I need them. And I don't just need them, you know, on a Sunday. I need him every day, every hour, every minute, every second. I am totally dependent on the Lord. So we bless God for you. The mission that God has sent you on. Walk in his authority. And he shall be with you. And realize people help you. But you don't need them. In Jesus name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. We love you. We'll see you back here next week. Amen.